I read a line this morning in the paper, and I've heard it recently, and I don't know if it's famous or, or what, but it caught my attention. It said, I'm not much, but I'm all I think about. And I think that defines most human beings, that we have an inordinate preoccupation with the not much that we are. And in a certain sense, that's the cause of most of our suffering. Because we are this tiny molecular speck of being in this vast consciousness. And we spend all of our time noodling around and focusing on this speck. And the whole idea of spiritual practice is to in a sense, release the tension of that preoccupation or to turn your mind, if you will, around and look inside and discover how big you really are. And then the same kind of preoccupation occurs, but it's different. You are no longer only thinking about your little mind. You're thinking about, if you're thinking at all, about the vastness of your being. One of the things that happens when you begin spiritual practice and you begin to turn your attention inward is you get a sense that everything you've been focused on is petty, unimportant, a waste of time, and yet you can't stop doing it. You are habitually locked in to this tightness, this smallness of being. But turning your attention inwards, inwards allows you to see the possibility of something else, of a release from being completely engaged in your minutia. And there begins a process of re-identification, of starting to, if you will, identify with this larger self. The mind doesn't make it easy. The mind is very, very interested in this larger self because it begins to think, oh my God, I have more I can be preoccupied with. I am now this big. I am now this vast thing. I am now this much greater, more powerful, more interesting phenomenon. And so what happens for many people in the early phases of spiritual work is they go from being totally caught up in this little tiny thing into being totally caught up into this bigger thing. And that's even more problematic. It causes more suffering. This is where spiritual work comes in. There are two forms of spiritual work that I will talk about. And these are very much sort of Rudy's definitions. There is the work of working on yourself. Rudy would call it to get above it. To get above your tension, to get above your noise, to get above the endless conflict that preoccupies us. And he gave us a practice for that. And it involved a lot of muscular striving. It was Take a breath. Hold your breath in your heart. Ask deeply inside for help to surrender. And the idea of help to surrender was that it would release you from the tension and you would rise up and be able to look down on the smallness of your being from a completely different perspective. 
And there was something remarkable about that practice and is remarkable about that practice because it gives us something to do so that we are not completely caught and compelled by our limitations. We don't sit and noodle around all day about, oh, I'm not this, I'm not that, I'm no good, I'm not that, or I am so great, I'm so wonderful, I'm so... You, what happens is you start to take a breath, you ask for help to surrender, and you rise above all that crap. and you feel release. There is nothing better in the world than feeling release from yourself. There was a whole Broadway play they did years ago called Stop the World, I Want to Get Off. And it's that feeling, oh, I'm off. I've released myself from that place. And then what happens for most people is you find that capacity to take a breath and get above it, and then you start to feel gravity pulling you back down. And a battle starts inside you, in which you don't want to go back down into that limited self. You want to be the big self. And so you kind of fight it and you lose. Everybody loses all the time. You lose the battle. You always come back into this. So you think, if I work harder, if I meditate longer, I will have this capacity to hold myself up there and I will be free of ever having to be this little tiny preoccupied entity. And in a way it sort of works. It really does start to do something very interesting. It starts to reshape you as a person. You get stronger. You become more capable. You have this ability to step out of you and have perspective, insight, understanding, and the ability to go, I don't want to re-enter that old pattern. I want to change that pattern. And you can change a pattern once you see the pattern. You can change the pattern once you have consciousness of it. When you are in the middle of your daily struggle, you don't see anything. But when you take a breath and you reach out and you... You can feel the bigness and you feel yourself re-entering into the old pattern and you go, no, I can change that. And you do this thing, or you can, of shifting. It's a tiny shift often, just a little shift, and you find the pattern is not what it was. And you're free of that pattern, at least for that moment. You may have to do it 400 times, but you start to change the self, the limited little self that seems to be running your life and causing you so much endless concern and preoccupation. So there really is some transformation that occurs. But the thing you can't forget is that no matter what you do, you keep coming back down to this. This isn't going anywhere for now. Living in this is work. You can choose not to work, which is a choice that many people make. Don't do anything. Just to go about your day. You know, reach for your pleasures, run away from your fears, go after the stuff you want, be miserable about the stuff you don't have, suffer, 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 and, uh, and pretend you're not. A little extra Ambien, Tylenol, you know, Xanax, I don't know, everybody's got their stuff. You know, a little, little drink. You find your thing to make you not suffer, but it doesn't work. It only works for a little while, then you need more and more and more. And ultimately you become imprisoned in that pattern, or spiritual life reawakens itself, or comes into the picture, and you go, oh, I have a different choice. I can actually transcend and then re-enter myself 
consciously. I can do it every day. I can do it all day long if I want. But at the core of this practice is a really interesting word. You take a deep breath and you ask inside for help to surrender. And the implication of surrender is you will take this breath and you will let go of all your shit. Or you might be able to let go of it and transform your shit a little bit so that when you re-enter it, it doesn't smell quite so bad. But you do come back into it. So the idea of surrender in the beginning of this practice makes you think, oh, I'm going to let go of the crap. And if I keep letting go and keep letting go, the crap won't be there. But that, for most people who've done this work for any length of time, they discover after 20, 30, 40 years, the crap's still there. They've lived above it, outside it, beyond it, or whatever, but it's still there. Now what? Now what? Surrender can take on a very different concept at that point. That concept is accept what is. Accept your shit. And that begins an entirely different aspect of spiritual practice. Because rather than trying to transcend and escape what you are, you move into the realm of being what you are. And if you want to get into real work, that's where it lies. It's easier to get out of you than to be consciously in you, in this tight knot of an entity that you are. And yet, if you can find the courage of true surrender, you can enter into this very uncomfortable space and just say, okay. That is work. That takes work. Because everything in you will want to get out of it. Everything in you will want to escape it. So it will be just like the beginning of your spiritual practice of trying to get out. You'll try to look for other things I can do. How can I dance around this discomfort? And you can't. You can't. All you can do is sit with it. But the miracle of sitting with you, sitting with the tension, the discomfort, the disarray, the lack of perfection, whatever you find. The extraordinary thing about that, if you become very still and don't fight it, don't resist it, truly surrender, something happens. And every one of you in this room has had this experience in this class, usually at the point where you can't take another breath and, you, and you're just tired of this whole, you know, let's let this be over. And you just sort of sit there and go, Oh, God. And you literally surrender. And then this thing happens. It's called, in my mind, I, don't, I call it the opening or the portal. Something goes, oh. And there's nothing there. Just this big, quiet, empty comfort. This sense of, Yes, the sense of well-being, the sense of arriving home. The fire roaring on a cold night, you step inside and it's just wonderful. That's what you arrive at. Then, just like when you're above it, you don't want to leave it either. Same thing. And you, you can sort of carry it with you a little bit. You can go back there through surrender. It becomes a muscle, that's what Rudy called it, a muscle of surrender. You start to go, okay, 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 to everything that arises. And you will find a lot of shit arising, more than you ever imagined. It just gets deeper and deeper. And you have to go, okay. Wow. Okay. Okay. And you keep working it. 
it's tough, real, demanding work. It's almost more demanding than taking a breath and getting above it. It's just allowing it to be. Somewhere, somewhere, for certain people, and I don't know the rules or how this works, this practice becomes so earnest and so real and so consistent and so the, the core element of your life that that purposefulness causes something to happen. And I call that, and I'm not alone to call it that, awakening. Awakening is a lightening of the load, an enlightenment, whereby the that voice that is thinking about you all the time gets quiet. It actually kind of falls away. And the way it's recognized, someone described it at that North Carolina conference is like there's a hand on your shoulder your whole life and suddenly it's not there. That inner voice just lifts off. That's an extraordinary moment in spiritual practice. When it occurred for me, I thought it was, and described it, I think, possibly as the end of my spiritual path. Well, of course, you now all know that it was not the end of my spiritual path. Nor is it the end, I think, of many people's spiritual paths, perhaps in various gradations. I can't tell you about that. I can only tell you about me. But the experience of losing, if you will, Bruce, was that something else was still there. And I call it the elemental self, some kind of core self. It has a lot to do with the body, the physicality. It's very powerful. It's very big. It's sort of contains the universe, if you will. But, in this vastness of being that you suddenly open to, this tiny little you is still there. This little speck of, in this case, Bruce, is still there. Only it's no longer Bruce trying to get to that, trying to get above Bruce or trying to accept Bruce. Bruce isn't there. It's just this and that. And they aren't separate. There's no separation. This and that is one thing. And this is why it's called non-duality. Because one is both instantly vast and instantly and infinitely small at the same time. We are all that. And the spiritual work that seems to exist in this space, and I'm speaking for Bruce and not for every person who's awakened or anybody else out there, but this thing that continues to be there is there is this elemental being which occasionally is very Bruce-like, and even becomes Bruce, if you will. And then there is this thing we all taste in this class. Everyone tastes it. This is the simple, <laughs> elemental vastness of your true being. Only rather than going from one to the other, it's just all there. This is on some level a very new configuration, and on another level it's the configuration that's always been there. The only difference is when you wake up you realize it, and when you aren't awakened you don't remember it, or you don't remember or know that it's that. You don't remember that you're the vastness of all being. You don't know that. 
You do know that, but you don't realize it. You don't, you're not walking around in that awakened state. Once you've awakened to that, I've dis discovered truly the beginning of spiritual work. Now, you know, Buddha sat under the bow tree and dealt with elemental forces of light and dark, temptations and terrors. And he sat there dealing with these forces as conceptual ideas is how we look at it. Some beautiful temptresses came by and tried to tempt him into you know, sensuality and lovemaking and horrible hordes of monsters came after him trying to terrorize him. And to all of us who think about that, it's like, oh, this is an idea. <laughs> this is something conceptual. But my experience in recent time is that it's not an idea, it's elemental forces at work. Big. Light and dark, yin-yang, all there is playing out playing out in some huge cosmological Maya driven drama that is not um, for the faint of heart. And yet we're all in it. Every one of us, every one of us from the tiniest baby to the oldest, wisest adult ultimately wakes up to this drama. You've been living in it every minute of your life. The drama of your preoccupation with yourself is actually your tiny little corner on the universal drama, on the struggle of light and dark, passion and terror. Every one of us lives that, but we live it with an ego mind, an ego mind that diminishes it into, damn it, I forgot my toothbrush, now they're going to have bad breath and people aren't going to listen, not going to be one that's sitting next to me, they're going to think I smell terrible and, they're, and I'm going to be a horrible person, whatever your thing is that starts to click off, that's this tiny little stuff. That's your corner of the battle. Remove ego from that and there's no protective source. There's no sheath membrane to protect you from the largeness of the universe's projections. <coughs> what Buddha experienced was it's all an illusion. And we like to think that it's all an illusion is like, oh, it's all an illusion. Fun. But it doesn't necessarily play out that way. It could. But it does. And, and when that moment arrives, I'll tell you about it. But knowing it's an illusion, facing it as an illusion, it's one thing to say it as an idea. It's another thing to be face to face with this truth. And so I've been telling people recently, if you want to go to the edge of this, hold your breath for three minutes. And somewhere in the two minute mark, maybe the one minute mark, you will start to understand the illusion and the power of that illusion. The description I gave a few weeks ago was standing on the ledge of the World Trade Center, fire behind you, 80 stories below you. That confrontation with the illusion of Maya. It's, it doesn't play lightly with us. It's heavy duty. And at some point, every human being will face a reckoning, if you will, with Maya, with elemental forces. Spiritual life is really just shedding all of the stuff that stands between you and that process. It's really surrendering to a deeper, stronger, and more re remarkable reality both in terms of its seductive beauty and of its horrific aspect, open to the totality of your being. 
and surrender. That's the work. That's the work. And you do it all day long. We do it all day long. Or we don't. And I will tell you, if you choose to do this work, you will grow, you will expand, you will find unbelievable depth in yourself, and you may awaken to your true nature. If you do not choose to do this work, you will, it will be no different. Not working and working, one, one produces the possibility of conscious result, the other just keeps you in deeper and deeper compression. But at some point in your life, I don't care who you are, the moment of finality will occur. And at that moment, which we call death, reality will expose itself to you completely. I have been working a lifetime, literally since I was a kid, but mostly since I was in my 20s, to open to and experience and know and accept the truth. And it has been a lifetime's work of work and struggle and effort. I am definitely concerned about people who decide to put this off to the last millisecond of their life. Because to go from this to that in a millisecond is, is not easy. It's not easy and you probably don't want to do that. But yet most people, that's what they do. And it's shattering and scary. And I'm using those words in very minuscule ways. It's beyond terrifying. You don't want to leave like that. I'm not trying to put the fear of God, God in you, because that's, you know, people, religious teachings have been doing that forever. I'm just trying to explain that somewhere along the way, one has to wake up to the truth of this. And the, the leaving of this world is that moment for most people. And it's a lot to accept, I think. Now look, some people may be just brilliant at it and just go, oh, okay. And that may be wonderful. Maybe that is true. Maybe that is the final moment for every human being. It's like, oh, or like Steve Jobs. Oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow. You know, it could be that moment for everybody. It could be. And in which case, why bother with spiritual work? Well, I'll tell you why to bother with spiritual work. It is possible before you're on your deathbed, in your 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s, to walk through life and go, Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So why put it off? Why wait for that? So, if it's going to be oh, wow at the end, then you will already be there. And if it's going to be traumatic at the end, at least you'll have worked your way through it. It'll be, I describe it like a Lamaze classes for for, new, for mothers, you know, I mean, you, 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 know, you practice and practice and you work all this stuff at home with your husband, you know, to be ready for that birth moment. But the birth moment, once you start having a baby, that all the lamas goes out the window. I suspect all meditation goes out the window and all your practice at the minute, the last minute of your life, because it's so real, there's nothing you can do. It takes over. So, why do we do this? Why bother in doing this? Why try to get above it? Why try to surrender to it? Why try to accept it? Well, primarily because it gives you a choice. It gives you an opportunity to touch truth, touch life, touch the world before it's taken away from you or before it's revealed to you in terms of what it truly was. And I think the worst thing that happens maybe at the end is you arrive at this moment of realizing, let's say, that everything that you ever saw, knew, or thought about was embraced and engulfed in love, and you never knew it. You never knew it. That may be the saddest thing of all. This is a great ride for all of us. We're all on it. This is one approach to it. I'm not pretending it's the approach. I don't know what's the approach, but I know that Everything that's been occurring in this drama and unfolding that 
this being has experienced feels really worth it, really worth it, important and necessary. And to not have that journey, wow, wow. Any questions? Uh, what's the difference between um, like saying yes to what occurs and uh, being awakened to your true nature and um, and um, accepting what it is? You know what I'm talking about? Well, I, my guess is, without knowing really what you're saying, is that there's no difference. You know, I mean, it's all a matter of, I'll tell you this, it doesn't matter to the universe. It doesn't care if you're awake or you're asleep. You're doing the thing you're supposed to be doing. It's doing it through you. And, you know, it seems to celebrate awakening. That's my sense of it. It seems to celebrate it, but it doesn't care exactly. I mean, it does care on some level. But really, in some penultimate sense, doesn't care. This is, it's, this is its entertainment. And it's created an unbelievable canvas for entertainment. And it involves horror and joy in the most remarkable way. And we all know what we want. You know, we all know what we would give our life for, in a way. Or I mean, some people wouldn't. But we all know what we want desperately and what we want to avoid desperately. And that's part of the canvas. And it's really the drama of human life. It's the, you know, every one of us is compelled by story. You know, we watch television, we go to the movies, we go to the theater, we talk to each other. All we're talking about is our story. And we love the story. The story is fascinating, beyond belief fascinating, and it seems important. So I can't tell you why it's important, except that the universe has manifested this storytelling device for some reason. Maybe the thing that's, that keeps us in our small self and being fascinated with our own story is the fear that the story probably doesn't really matter or that if we're not involved in the story, what would we be? Because it seems like, scientifically, it takes more energy to, do this, to be this small than to be this big. It seems like being this big isn't really more of a matter of letting go. I think, I mean, I think you're right. I mean, I think one of the reasons the story is ongoing is our fear of letting it go. You know, I really, I really feel that. Or, you know, this cosmic loneliness that people are afraid of. You know, I mean, why did this, whatever it is that has manifested here, come into being at all? Why? Well, there's some vague sense that it needed to be entertained. But I don't know if that's a truth, but it just feels that way. I think that the cosmic loneliness is an interesting thing. It's an interesting thing in our Western society, our modern society, because we've made more and more devices to withdraw from community, but to say we're part of a bigger community. You know, I treat, so therefore I am, or right, no, I have exactly. all these friends on Facebook. But in fact, you're sitting in a little room. Well, that's a very important fact. I mean, I mean, it goes beyond that, and I won't start that dialogue now, but I talked about it a couple of weeks ago, about what is really going on here. We are, there's nothing going on. <laughs> you know, it, it's so other than what we imagine it to be. It's, there is nothing but a, a, an emptiness that fills, but it's all empty, and it just keeps filling, and that's the ride. But it's our need to fill it, oh, enough. Well, our need, or, I, you know, I, I can't give you, I can't tell you that. No, 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 I don't mean it's, a, it's our need in terms of the elemental. Mm -hmm. But since we have this fear and this cosmic loneliness and this idea that we're supposed to be important, and we tell our kids all the time how important they are and how everything they do, and you know, then we see Tiger Mom and say, she's awful, she doesn't say that Miss Gold is a good thing, but we're like, way to kick the ball, and Tiger Mom says, didn't get in the goal, and we don't like that. So we, we you know, ra we were raised thinking we're very important, 
by people who felt they were very important for producing us. We raise other children, our own children, and we bask in the reflected glory. It goes and on we're and told on. Since we're yeah. very small, that it's right. vitally important. Right, and we are, in a sense. I mean, in the end, we're, we're perhaps more important than anybody even imagines, mm -hmm. and each one of us equally. Extraordinary and important, but not in our smallness, only in our well, No, perhaps in, there's only one thing really. It's in, extraordinary in all senses of the word. This, I, I it's hard to dialogue about this too much because it starts it starts to become stuff one picks apart, and uh, and trying to understand it for me has always been uh, problematic because I think there's something different between understanding and knowing, and understanding doesn't solve the problem. Knowing does. So, arriving at knowing comes from letting go of trying to understand. And then you go, ah, and you can't even put it into words. You can't even conceptualize it. You just go, ah, or wow, wow. Anyone else? We're run out of time. Okay. Uh, a quick, a quick thing. Um, class next week, Blanche will be teaching. I'm going to go off to L.A., uh, and I'll be back in January on the East Coast and how classes will work, I don't know, but we'll figure that out as we get closer. Either be in the city or be up here or some mix of that. And in the meantime, uh, as I've required since I leave so often, uh, this is not a work that's teacher directed. It feels that way. It feels like you come somewhere to get this, but I've said to you thousands of times, there's nowhere to go. Just sit down and do it. The only thing a teacher does is hold you accountable, maybe, you know, but you can hold yourself accountable. You're all mature, you're all capable. Every one of you is brilliant in your own capacity to do this if you want to do it. And so do it. And the muscle you build doing it on your own is remarkable. And uh, you can have just as great experience, if you want to call it that, or practice on your own as you can by coming here. So keep it going and uh, I'll see you guys in the spring or it'll be the winter I guess, January sometime. Thank you all. Thank you.